Hey everybody and welcome back to part three of the Apex Power Design walkthrough series. I'm Broderick and last time we used Power Design to create a power filter for a PWM audio amplifier. Then we built that filter and compared its frequency response to Power Design's calculations. If you were watching carefully you would have noticed that the attenuation plot curled up a bit at higher frequencies. And that curl wasn't there in Power Design's graph. I'm willing to bet it was because of parasitic R's, L's, and C's that we never modeled in power design. Well today, we're going to model those parasitic elements. Once everything's nice and accurate, we'll analyze the voltage, current, and power in the whole system. Then we'll have enough information to pick a heatsink. Lastly, we'll build the circuit and test out those calculations. Picking up right where we left off, you can see that my filter is made of these nice, ideal inductors and capacitors. But that's not how the real world works. So right from Power Design, you can click the Filter Parasitics tab and add the R's, L's, and C's that we neglected last time. Power Design provides these default equations as a guideline to help you get some first pass estimates. I'll use the default equations for inductors and ceramic capacitors. And already the transfer function has changed drastically. From the schematic tab, you can see that the inductors now have about 20 milliohms of series resistance and 20 picofarads of coil-to-coil -coil capacitance. From the datasheet, I already know that my inductors are different from this. They actually have 37 milliohms and 5 nanofarads. Now that that's corrected, my transfer function looks much more like the bench frequency sweep that we did in the last video. The next step is in applying the application details in the Define Circuit Parameters tab. Power Design already knows our supply voltage and switching frequency, but it doesn't know any of the yellow details, such as the signal frequency and output voltage. So I'll go ahead and fill those in. I'll say our signal frequency on average is mil C, or 262 hertz. Our output voltage will try to achieve 50 watts of power in the 8 ohm load, meaning we need to the output to swing from negative 28.3 volts to positive 28.3 volts. To verify that our voltages and currents into the load are appropriate, we can check the frequency sweeps of several different attributes. First, I'll narrow our scope to the audible spectrum. And in this drop-down menu, we can select what the plot displays. I'll choose voltage. The voltage at the load is about 20 volts RMS at the frequencies we care about, meaning the current should be about 2.5 amps RMS for 50 watts. And it is. There's a little bit of attenuation here because the filter is imperfect, but this gets us roughly 50 watts into the speaker. We can even view the overall power. In orange, the true load power is displayed, about 49 watts decreasing with frequency. There's also about 9 watts dissipated in the amplifier itself. However, there's a mutual dependence between the junction temperature and the electrical power dissipation, so this may change when we select a heatsink. Up in the heatsinking section, Power Design is suggesting a heatsink with a thermal resistance of 5.54 degrees C per watt. Well, it turns out that I have a heatsink with 5.6 degrees C per watt, so let's try that. We just barely exceed the maximum case temperature, and the power dissipation is now 10.7 watts. This is probably fine for a prototype because power design assumes worst case power dissipation. The real power dissipation is likely a few watts lower. But just to be safe, I'll try to improve the efficiency a little by decreasing the switching frequency. So now we have 9 watts of power dissipation in the amplifier and our case temperature is 77 degrees Celsius. Lastly, go to the advanced tab and we can see exactly how the power breaks down inside the SAO9. We can also see that the load power is indeed close to 50 watts. I've built the circuit on the same board we built our power filter on. I've also attached a thermocouple to the SAO9 so we can monitor case temperature and compare the bench results with power design. All that's left to do is power the circuit and feed in a signal. Here's our differential output signal, about 20 volts RMS just as predicted, and very low noise. Using the exact heat sink that we modeled in power design, the case temperature turns out to be 74 degrees C after 20 minutes of operation. That's very close to our prediction of 77 degrees C. So now we have a functioning amplifier prototype circuit that was designed entirely in power design. It even helped us pick a heatsink based on both the thermal and electrical models. 
Some designs can stop here, relying on the properties of the PWM amplifier to produce consistent results. But things like changing supply voltages, part-to-part -part variation, and different ambient temperatures can have a large effect on the outputs of these devices. So in the next video, we'll use power design to create a closed loop system and reject those disturbances. Thanks for watching.